She is the Assistant Professor and Founding Director of the Persian Studies Program in the College of Humanities at San Francisco State University. She lectures there on languages and cultures of the um, Persianate societies as well as world religions. Next to her is Trita Parsi. He's the founder and president of the National Iranian American Council and an expert on US-Iranian relations, Iranian foreign policy, and the geopolitics of the Middle East. And to your left, Reza Zargami. He currently practices law in the Environment, Land Use, and Natural Resources Practices Group at Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw Pittman LLP, and he is author of Discovering Cyrus, the Persian Conqueror Astride the Ancient World. And on your right is Jay Shu, our moderator. He's the director of the Asian Art Museum and a dedicated specialist um, scholar in Chinese antiquities. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Jay. I'll ask that the panelists um, actually hold the microphone um, to your mouth when you are prepared to, uh, to make remarks and um, that would help the sound quality be the best. So Jay, please take it away. And please give some uh, applause for our panelists today. Um, thank you, Deb. Can you hear me? And I'm really exceedingly pleased to have uh, three leading authorities on ancient Persia as well as contemporary Iran to share their thoughts with us and reflecting on the scope, immediate, extremely rich scope of what this exhibition will entail. I think we can basically break down our um, discussion into four categories. The Cyrus Cylinder itself and the Cyrus the Great and his time and also the influence of the Cyrus cylinder and its message in the later ages, for example, in the Age of Enlightenment, and then, of course, the contemporary relevance in the world politics. So, and we have about an hour, and our uh, specialists um, have shared a lot in common in their research, but also they have their own specialty as well. And our audience, that's you, have different interests as a common interest. Some may be more interested in contemporary, and some may be more interested in ancient times in the uh, Cyrus Cylinder and the Cyrus the Great, his own time. So I will try to rotate the questions and among our speakers as well among the topics. We have about 60 minutes, and after that, we have about 20 minutes for questions and answers from the audience. So my job is to really be as brief and so that our speakers can speak more. So let me start with the first question. And, um, the question what I'd like to pose is to what extent is Cyrus the Great's message unique in his time? Many have suggested that this message as seen on Cyrus Cylinder represents absolutely no break from tradition and that his predecessors supposedly issued a similar statements at the beginning of their reigns as propaganda for the masses. So I'd like to ask Reza to take lead the answer this question, but our other two scholars, please share your views if you feel like. Okay, thank you. There is no doubt, in my opinion, that the Cyrus Cylinder does belong to this traditional Mesopotamian genre of building inscriptions. And these texts were typically composed during periods of political transition. And they all followed more or less the same pattern. And that pattern began with a recitation of the king's titles or an exaltation of the gods. It then began by describing how deficient the previous regime was. It was axiomatic. The guys who came before had to be absolute rubbish. And then it talked about how the gods supported the new king and helped him achieve his conquests. And from there it moved on to talk about how the people, the people of Babylon, accepted the new king. And finally, these inscriptions typically ended with a discussion of the new kings, building works, or temple dedications within Babylon. And the Cyrus Cylinder, as John Curtis touched upon, it does include these elements. It follows the pattern very closely. In addition, the Cyrus Cylinder, we do know, borrows entire statements and phrases from some of the previous inscriptions. But I think there's a very good reason for this, and that is that the Cyrus Cylinder was composed with the help of temple scribes, most likely affiliated with the temple of Marduk. Marduk was the chief god of the Babylonian pantheon. 
Uh, the previous Babylonian king had tried to interfere with his position in the religious life of the Babylonians, and so the Babylonian temple of Marduk supported Cyrus in his takeover of the country. And these prescribes, we do know, they were not, they did not emphasize, they did not appreciate literary innovation in their compositions. They in fact thought that their inscriptions took on a greater air of austerity if they mimicked previous texts. And the Cyrus Cylinder, again, in this sense, is part of this genre. But I think the Cyrus Cylinder also stands out. And there are three points I'd like to make. First of all, we can't lose sight of the fact that Cyrus was an Iranian. He was not a Mesopotamian, he was not a Babylonian, he was not an Assyrian. The fact that he's going out of his way to show himself to be a legitimate king of Babylon, to really communicate with the Babylonians in their own religion, is in and of itself remarkable. Secondly, the Cyrus Cylinder, as John Curtis mentioned, does not emphasize any violence. In fact, it, it repeats in different ways how the Persian takeover was peaceful. And this is something that you don't get in all these previous inscriptions. In fact, there's an inscription of Ashurbanipal. He was the last truly great king of the Assyrian Empire, and he conquered Babylon about a hundred years before Cyrus. And in his cylinder inscription, he talks about how he starved the city into submission, and he forced the people to eat the flesh of their sons and their daughters for subsistence. And then after he entered the city, he singled out those officers who had broken their oaths to him. And he whipped them and he chopped them into little pieces. And he says while their flesh was still quivering, he fed it to the animals and to the fish. Cyrus's message is very different. He says, I entered Babylon without a battle. He says, my soldiers walked the streets of Babylon with their weapons packed away. And he says, I did not allow anyone in my innumerable army to terrorize the people of Sumer and Akkad. That, to me, is very impressive and marks a break with the past. And third, the scope of the restoration work in the Cyrus Cylinder far exceeds what we see in these previous texts. Most of the predecessor inscriptions, they talk about restoration work, the king touching up some buildings within Babylon or the cities surrounding it. The Cyrus Cylinder talks about work being undertaken as far afield as Susa, which is in modern-day Iran, as far to the north as Assyria, Ashur. And then finally, again, the claim to have restored deported peoples to their home is very, this wasn't a common claim that other Mesopotamian kings made. In fact, to my knowledge, only three kings made similar claims in the past five to six centuries before Cyrus. So when you put it all together, in my mind, what you see is you see the Cyrus Cylinder, yes, it goes out of its way to conform to this traditional Mesopotamian type. But if you read between the lines, what you see is an effort to show Cyrus as embodying those attributes of only the most humane and merciful of the kings to come before him. Great, thank you so much. Uh, let me, let's naturally lead to a second question. What was the day-to-day -day life like under Cyrus' great rule? And what was his capital, Pasagade, look like? So, Mitra, do you want to take the lead and answer that question? Well, um, I do my best here. Um, when we're talking about Cyrus himself, um, it's extremely important that we understand who we're talking about here. Um, even Cyrus Cylinder itself, uh, we need to remember that we need to look at it beyond an object. Um, it's a symbolic of a culture, a religious practice perhaps, a philosophy, um, and the person behind it. So. To better understand Cyrus, Cyrus the Great, um, we need to understand his background, who he was, where he came from, uh, what type of society he was living in, and what type of rituals and um, cultural practices perhaps he had. Um, as Reza mentioned, Cyrus is known as um, a Persian. Um, uh, when we're talking about uh, Persia or Iran, it's very important that we understand the terms. Um, um, if you allow me, I would like to clarify what we're talking about here. Um, Cyrus was belonged to a particular tribe, um, which we refer to as um, uh, Parsa or Persian, a tribe which belonged to a larger community uh, known as um, Indo-Iranians. Um, 
Persian itself, of course, the terms used back then were quite different from today. Uh, the sense of nationality didn't exist the way it exists today. Um, he spoke a language uh, which we recognize as Persian, one of the Persian languages of his time, um, a language of one of the languages of Indo-Iranian languages. Um, sometimes people refer to him as Iranian, or sometimes people have the tendency to get confused between the term Iran and Persia. The country itself, the Iranian plateau, um, in which various Iranian tribes lived, um, was not called Persia. Um, it was Iranian plateau. The word Persia, as the name of a country, came into existence as the result of um, uh, Alexander's invasion and uh, Greek historians who refer to the region and uh, Cyrus um, as Persian. Persian, uh, in reality, was uh, a particular region of the Iranian plateau uh, called uh, Pars, which is roughly the same area as uh, uh, the province of uh, Fars today. Um, and since these people in this particular region spoke the language which was known as Persia, Alexander assumed that the entire Iranian uh, uh, territory under the reign of uh, Achaemenid kings um, were also speaking Persian and uh, they were of uh, Persian um, uh, traits. Um, so Cyrus himself, a Persian, one of the tribes, many tribes of the Indo-Iranians who migrated into the Iranian plateau um, uh, roughly in the second millennium BCE. Um, of course, this uh, tribe, this particular tribe, wasn't the first tribe to move into the Iranian plateau. Um, the first tribes, um, the first known tribe uh, was uh, um, Medes. Uh, Medians, again, another Iranian, Indo-Iranian tribe moving into the Iranian plateau, spoke an Iranian language. Um, so, both tribes, uh, of course, Persians and uh, Medes, um, were followed by other Iranian tribes from the um, southern steppes, Russian steppes, into the plateau. Um, and we recognize them by, um, um, as uh, uh, Sogdians, uh, Bactrians, um, uh, Khorasmians. And they were all considered to be Iranian tribes. Not necessarily Persian, though. Uh, so when we're talking about Cyrus and getting to know Cyrus better, um, it's extremely important that we understand his lineage, his ancestors, um, his assumably religious beliefs, uh, rituals, and uh, worldviews, which was, um, we know for sure, was rooted in the Indo-Iranian traditions um, of the third and second millennium BCE um, of the uh, northern part of Iran, the northern part of Central Asia. Yeah, thank you very much. Mitra, actually, you preempted me. In, I do, you know, we sometimes use the Iranian and Persian interchangeably. I think it's very important to have a historical distinction. And uh, we do well go back to ask later on the question about the capitals of uh, the Persian Empire. They were just so fascinating. But let me, if I may move on to another question. As John Curtis mentioned, uh, Cyropedia, be a must read, and uh, uh, written by Xenophon in the classical times. But its significance, of course, is much, much more than uh, that in the in Age of Enlightenment, and uh, also John mentioned uh, Thomas Jefferson himself on the two copies. And uh, I believe in the Age of Enlightenment, not only Sauropedia was a must read, another highly recommended or required reading is Machiavelli's book called The Prince. So, to juxtaposing these two 
piece of writing together, one seemed to emphasize on magnanimous, the other seemed to be emphasized on fear, rather than feared, rather than beloved. So take these two things together. Which form in the, their time, as well as looking forward in the later times, so which form that is more effective mode of governance, or a combination of two, or you know, uh, why Cyrus did it so differently from uh, some of his uh, predecessors who were famously violent. So any of you would like to take the lead? Yeah. I'll take that. Um, I, think, I think realistically, both benevolence and a more forceful approach had a role in Cyrus's statecraft. And Xenophon himself says this in the introduction to the Cyropedia. What he says is that Cyrus was able to win the absolute loyalty of his subjects, both on account of this intrinsic charisma that he had. He had this amazing capacity to make people want to please him, but also because he was able to instill fear in his foes. And we know from history that there were practical consequences to defying Cyrus. But I think there are two sets of evidence that we should consider in answering this question. And I alluded to one already, and that's the Cyrus Cylinder. Uh, how violence doesn't factor into the text there. And this is something that carries over to the inscriptions of Cyrus's successors. In the old Persian inscriptions, we see virtually no mention of war or conquest. The king's power is, is exalted. There is mention made of all the numerous countries over which he rules, but there's no mention of the actual violence involved in the conquest. And then when you consider also the art, the monumental art of the Achaemenid period, when you go to Pasargada, it doesn't have, unfortunately, a great deal left, but when you go to Persepolis and you see the bas-reliefs that are left on the palace walls, and when you see what the French have excavated from Susa, which was the administrative capital of the empire, you do not see scenes of war and conquest the way you do, for example, from the remains of the palaces of the Assyrian kings, where we see very vivid descriptions of cities being sacked, of populations, people being rounded up and marched off into exile, of prisoners being skinned alive, impaled, blinded by the king. And so what this tells me is if given the option, the Persian kings definitely would have much rather been loved than fear. And in fact, I think what sets their statecraft apart from that of the Assyrians and the Babylonians is this emphasis on winning the support of their subjects. If I could yes, add a couple of things. I'm, I'm the odd man out here in this panel. I know nothing about anything that happened beyond 50 years ago. Uh, <laughs> but I think I can say a couple of words about this specific issue when it comes to the manner in which the thinking behind Cyrus's way of governing has been so different. Out there in the hall, you will see that there is a um, quote from Machiavelli talking about the greatness of Cyrus as one of the big leaders. At the same time, Machiavelli himself taught a philosophy that is quite in contrast to what I think many would believe Cyrus would have adhered to. And there's an important point here because any political science major in any American university, one of the first books that they will read is the, re, uh, the book of Machiavelli, The Prince, in which these young political science students are being taught that a good ruler at the end of the day would rather be feared than to be loved. Uh, where these minds of these young political scientists are formed uh, in what is called the, the realist school of thought in international relations theory that clearly is, is in contrast to the completely different uh, approach that at least we can glean from uh, where Cyrus is coming from. And I think this is important in the sense that um, this has become completely paradigmatic into how we understand governance and how we understand relations between states. And there, Cyrus is the exception. Cyrus is the complete opposite that it is being compared to. Great. And Trita, I want to stay with you for a second, because I'm really going to go to contemporary now. As a, as a matter of fact, August the 3rd, this is August the 8th. And August 3rd, uh, you know, Hassan Luani was recently elected as the president of uh, the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran. And so uh, Iran's political landscape that could, could potentially be changing because he is widely considered to be a moderate, pragmatic politician. And so given the 21st century nature of Iranian politics, 
how likely that, that he will actually institute substantive reforms? Could he, the political ideas, be a second coming of Cyrus, a tolerant and accepting ideology? Or will his strong relationship with the supreme leader, Ali Ahmadine, stand in the way? Thank you. Um, we're drifting pretty far away from Cyrus, I would say, uh, if we're going to compare Rouhani to him. Um, what is interesting, though, is, of course, that we see uh, uh, just as much as Cyrus, when he's going to Babylonia, is invoking Marduk in order to have local legitimacy. The Shah was invoking Cyrus in order to justify his reign. And then later on, in the last 10 years or so, we've seen particular individuals uh, in the Islamic Republic trying to uh, in one way or another uh, invoke Cyrus uh, as part of either their interpretation of nationalism uh, or whatnot. And then you also have an international implications of all of this. One thing, one symbolism that I think uh, Cyrus could play a very accurate and, and important role for is in the international realm, particularly between Iran and Israel. And I mention this because more often than not, when we're talking about Iran and Israel, uh, we oftentimes see that historical um, uh, parallels are, are either manufactured or try to be invoked, and those are almost exclusively negative ones. You have the invocation of saying that some of the leaders of the Islamic Republic are modern-day Hamans from the story of Esther, the, the person uh, in the Bible that I was conspiring to convince the Persian king to exterminate all of the Jews in the city of Susa, but the whole thing turned around and instead they got uh, exterminated. You have uh, interviews in which advisors to Israeli Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu has confirmed that Netanyahu views Iran as a modern-day Amalek, which those of you who know the Bible know that this is a story in which uh, the god Yahweh essentially orders the Jews to completely exterminate the Alamekites and, and refers to them as the inherent and historical enemies of the Jewish people. And this, these are things that are being invoked in order to create a modern narrative that uses aspects of current realities to create an idea that there's some form of a permanent enmity at play here. Whereas reality is that there are plenty of parallels and things you can invoke to prove exactly the opposite. To prove everything from the greatness of Cyrus uh, when it comes to the treatment of the Jewish people and the, the financing of the rebuilding of the Second Temple, or to uh, refer to the friendship between Dar Dariush the Great and, uh, and Daniel, etc. And these are things that the story of Cyrus, unfortunately, currently is not being used for. Instead, you see a lot of the opposites taking place. And I think these are missed opportunities because you will never be able to finally have some sort of resolution unless you can ground it in a broader narrative with some historical accuracy. Thank you. And you mentioned uh, the Jews and uh, the Bible. Thank you. So let's go back to history again. So the, my next question was that, uh, how important was the Cyrus Cylinder's discovery in confirming the story of Cyrus freeing the Jews as told by the Old Testament, given the differences in each version of the story? Micha, you would like to take that on? Sure, absolutely. Um, I, uh, actually, I was never under the impression that um, the story was disputed at any time. Uh, the uh, uh, the events of uh, involvement of uh, not only uh, Cyrus the Great, but also his uh, descendants, um, for instance, Darius, uh, who pretty much followed the um, um, ideology of Cyrus, um, respecting uh, all religions and cultures and providing um, uh, freedom of uh, um, expression and uh, religious practices. Um, his name is also, as a historical document, is mentioned um, in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, so was uh, Xerxes, um, as uh, Trita mentions, and um, Artaxerxes, who continued uh, the um, um, practices of uh, their forebears. Um, so, um, but I think that issue is important today, as Trita mentioned, due to the uh, socio-political ambience of our time to once again um, use this Cyrus um, figure 
and practices as a model for our society, for our global society, a model for uh, a multicultural tolerance and harmonious coexistence. Um, of course, we all know that we live in a diverse society, but I highly believe that um, we don't exactly know how to conduct or uh, monitor our society. Um, so the fact that the cinder, cylinder is now further confirming the stories of um, uh, Persian king's involvements with the um, Hebrew people um, should be used as a model, uh, a model that I think our rulers uh, very much need because they have no idea how to uh, really um, uh, provide um, um, social rules uh, for our multicultural um, environment. Thank you. Yeah. Reza, if I may please. add to that, uh, I think there are two ways in which the Cyrus Cylinder confirms and corroborates the biblical account. Uh, now, the cylinder itself does not mention the Jews. It talks about the people of Babylon and then of settlements to the east and to the north of Babylon. And as we know, Jerusalem is many hundreds of miles to the west. But it does show that Cyrus was in the habit of restoring these exiled peoples who had been deported. He was in the habit of re returning them to their homelands and then of expending funds and taking steps to rebuild their sanctuaries. And this is, of course, what the Old Testament says. The other thing is the phraseology of the Cyrus Cylinder. There are parallels between that and the exaltation of Cyrus in the book of Isaiah. And what that, is, for example, and Mr. Curtis again touched upon this, where in the Cyrus Cylinder it is said that Marduk, the great god of Babylon, he calls Cyrus by name and he grasps his hand and he leads him to victory. In the Old Testament, we have Yahweh, the God of Israel. He summons Cyrus in righteousness. He also grasps him by the hand, and then he opens gates before him. And what this tells me is that the biblical account must have, been, must have originated very close in time to the time of the Cyrus Cylinder, and that it does reflect history. Great. And um, let's expand it to the time that Cyrus the Great ruled, and uh, John, uh, Curtis, in his excellent introduction, mentioned that uh, there's still debate about whether Cyrus Great is a believer of uh, Zoroastrianism. He personally think he was at the same time, and he also worshipped the Babylonian god, like Maduk. So can you tell us what is the religious life of Cyrus the Great his time, and his own personal beliefs, and what will be the evidence to, to, to sure support thing. what you will say? Well, we know that for a fact, people back then were very superstitious and very religious. And the proper performance of religious rituals and cultic activity was very important to them, obviously much more so than it was today. And that they really saw the hand of God in everything. In fact, there's a, there's a legend that Herodotus, the famous Greek historian, relates, and he says that Darius I, who was the next great king of the Achaemenid period, he became king because his horse was the first to neigh at sunrise. And this gives you an idea again of how superstitious the people were. With respect to Cyrus, I, my, my own personal view is that what in the Cyrus Cylinder, he pays lip service to Marduk. He does that as a political measure. The real debate is whether he was, he, he, his own gods were Iranian, and the real debate is whether he was a Zoroastrian or a follower of the traditional at that time, the traditional polytheistic pagan Iranian religion, which was most likely centered around the god Mithra. And I think there are three important factors that point to Cyrus being a Zoroastrian. The first is that at Pasar Gadai, which was his capital, among the few buildings that are left, or the few constructions, we know that there's a fire altar, and that this fire altar very closely resembles the one that we see on the tomb reliefs of Darius I and his successors. And we know that at least some, if not all, of these kings were Zoroastrians. Secondly, we know that Cyrus named his eldest daughter Atosa. This was not just any name. This is the equivalent of a Christian naming his daughter Mary. In the Zoroastrian tradition, Atosa is the first great female convert to the religion. She is the wife of Kavi Vishtas. Vishtas is the royal patron of the prophet Zoroaster, who takes him under his wing and protects him from persecution. So this, to me, shows that Cyrus was familiar with 
and generally accepted the Zoroastrian religious tradition. And then the third, and this goes back to the Old Testament, as a matter of fact. In the book of Isaiah, in every time, practically every time that Cyrus is mentioned, the mention of Cyrus is prefaced by a description of God's creative capacity. And in fact, this is really, it's the book of Isaiah where the notion of Yahweh as the creator of the cosmos is really first established in Judaism. And there's a very important biblical scholar from Columbia University named Morton Smith, who in 1963 wrote an article which very persuasively argued that the, these concepts entered the Bible as a result of Iranian religious influence, specifically at the time of Cyrus. And based on what we know about the Iranian religion, there is no hard proof that there was ever this all-encompassing creator god outside of the Zoroastrian god, Ahura Mazda. So, Again, we do not have definitive proof as to Cyrus's religion, but these factors to me, if I may introduce some legalese into the uh, conversation, they place the burden of proof, I think, on the parties who try to say that he was not a Zoroastrian. I think this is a very good uh, time. Thank you for our audience to uh, make up their mind on their own whether what you said has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Exactly. So I think it's a <laughs> continuing conversation. So again, you know, the religion is as important today as any time moment in the human history. And today religion is uh, ever so more important. So, and we all, one can say that history has always been manipulated depending on who wields the power at any given time. So my next question was, was Shah Riza Pahlavi's use of a cylinder any different from Muhammad Ahmadi Dinajad's use of um, the Iranian heritage? Yeah, what's the. Trita, you want to give it a try? I'm pointing at Riza. <laughs> no, I'm not no, touching this you. one. <laughs> That's all you, Trita. I think you're pointing at Riza. I don't even know where to begin on that one, to be completely <laughs> frank with you. Um, look, I, I think I mentioned earlier, earlier on that, you know, uh, there, there is a tremendous need for folks who probably know that they are not completely legitimate to find any type of symbol, symbolism to be able to grant themselves certain levels of symbolism. It was mentioned earlier on in Curtis's um, um, presentation that now this is being used as some form of a um, uh, Iranian nationalism in Iran and I think if you just put it in the context of what Ahmadinejad was trying to do here's an individual who at the end of the day when he ended up in a conflict with Iran's supreme leader Ali Khamenei realized very quickly he himself had no real constituency inside of Iran he was riding on the constituency of uh, the conservatives who between Ahmadinejad and Khamenei clearly would go with Khamenei. And in the last couple of years of his reign, he was desperately trying to uh, lure in other segments of the Iranian society who were largely outside of the political sphere because of the rep repressive nature of the political system there and, and, and cultivate them as folks that would be uh, loyal to him or that uh, come across as being representing their identity or their views. Needless to say, he was uh, uh, miserably unsuccessful because it didn't matter how much he tried to use the language of Persian nationalism, uh, very few, if any, were willing to forgive all of the other things that he stood for and that he had done that went completely counter to the very idea of uh, Persian nationalism amongst the people that he was trying to convince. So, again, you will see Cyrus or any other significant person be used and abused uh, throughout history by politicians who would try to have their legitimacy, the, the legitimacy of Cyrus rub off on them. But this one is probably one of the ones that would fall into the category of comical, perhaps. Good. <laughs> I think politics often the case is comical. Yes. If I may just add to that, uh, and, and I don't want to get into whether the Shah of Iran, uh, Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi, whether he portrayed the Cyrus Cylinder accurately or not from a historical standpoint, but one of the things that he was trying to do was to cultivate a national pride. And I think this gets overlooked in the modern dialogue, perhaps, of how he was trying to uh, how he emphasized these ancient artifacts. Uh, many Iranians here may find it very curious to know that the name of Cyrus, 
Cyrus himself was almost forgotten in his homeland several centuries after he lived. And it was really because of this nationalistic movement of the Pahlavi dynasty that the names of Cyrus and Darius, that the Iranians became reacquainted with these figures. And in fact, there's a very charming anecdote about in the 19th century, there was a European ambassador who told the Shah of Iran at the time, it must be such an honor to be part of the same lineage as these people. And he looked at him and he said, who, who's Cyrus? I mean, I, I don't know who he is. So <laughs> anyways, I'm just saying that the Shah, yes, he may have had his motives, and I'm not here to defend him as a political figure, but he was also trying to reacquaint his own people with their ancient history. Great. And um, whatever one's use of a heritage, one need to have the heritage to start with. So let's go back to the history again, and I'd like to go back to Mitra. Is that uh, what is life like uh, in general sense in the Cyrus Great's time? And we're all impressed whether we've been to Persepolis or not with the great monuments, uh, architecture ruins. But we also know it was built after Cyrus Great's time. And his capital was Pasagadi, and there are not much remaining. So could we use the, the Persepolis as evidence to look backwards at uh, Cyrus Great's? own capital and uh, whether it's looking at it from religious perspective, you know, just ordinary life perspective, and what's life like during his time? Right. Um, it's very important that we keep in mind every time we're talking about religion or um, uh, other social uh, terms, designations, we don't project our views today of that concept, for instance, what we think of religion today, onto the past. Uh, so when we're talking about uh, Cyrus's religion, uh, you have to keep in mind that probably Cyrus himself uh, never thought of religion the way we think of religion today. Um, and, you know, probably accepting gods and rituals um, were part of life. Um, so it's, it's very important that we keep that straight here. Um, as far as better understanding Cyrus's environment um, and way of life, I think we have enough um, information about Cyrus um, um, and even his own capital, Pasargade, uh, which is located in the province of Pars uh, today, to determine uh, what his world views uh, perhaps were. Um, he built Pasargade for himself. Um, there he built his palaces, uh, perhaps a fire altar. Mm, we don't know exactly his views on the concept of that fire cult or if fire played any role in his daily rituals or practices. We can read into all that. And um, he was the lover of uh, nature, trees, and gardens and he built um, a vast garden uh, which has been used as a model um, uh, of, for Persian gardens which later on was, the design was exported to um, South Spain, from South Spain to even Taj Mahal, uh, which I think we all know about or seen photos of. Um, and then there he built a tomb for himself of course, based on the altar, fire altar itself, and his burial site, and his views, and the design of the garden, which, by the way, um, uh, it was referred to as uh, paradises, which is uh, uh, the root of the word paradise. There are many uh, Persian words today in our American language, and paradise, it's uh, one of those words. Um, in, the, in old uh, Persian, uh, the word paradise basically meant uh, an enclosure of some sort. So th that is another influence of uh, uh, perhaps um, Persian culture and religion onto um, later developed uh, religious traditions such as uh, Christianity and Islam. Um, in this garden, um, um, it's very interesting, the design um, uh, has been created by dividing the land um, into four different corners. And um, if we 
understand the cosmology that perhaps uh, Cyrus believed in, um, we would understand how he designed the garden and what he was trying to communicate here. So um, um, we know that he lived in a very uh, diverse society, various religions um, and cultures and languages. Um, and this is unfortunately as much as uh, we know about him. It's easy to uh, let our imagination fly uh, with uh, Cyrus's time and religious practices and what he was thinking and what he was doing on daily basis, uh, but everything is going to be speculations at this point. Um, but I think it uh, would be more um, uh, appropriate to go with what we know uh, historically, archaeologically, and linguistically in particular. Uh, because um, in our profession, studying ancient religions, we heavily rely on linguistic comparisons, and then we bring in archaeology um, and uh, later written texts um, to, in hope of reconstructing um, the environment. This is really a rigorous scholar as speaking. Thank you so much to make sure that, uh, you know, history <laughs> by definition requires imagination, but it has to be very solidly rooted in facts. So actually, I'd like to go back to the exhibition. Besides the Cyrus Cylinder, of course, the exhibition also has the famous Oxus Treasures. It's a small exhibition, but magnificence of which I think is indescribable. And beside that, there's also another very important piece of object, which is Darius cylinder seal. The impression shows that he's standing on a chariot and doing lion hunting. So, of course, look at his face value, we know what he's trying to portray, but in the historical context, what Darius trying to say here and how Cyrus the Great would portray himself in such similar settings. So, we do require some historical imagination now. <laughs> so, so any of you would like to take it up? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll take that one. We know that lion hunting, and that's the seal you're talking about. He's on his chariot, he's shooting the lion. Lion hunting was a lordly sport par excellence in ancient times. Uh, it, in, in Mesopotamia, we have inscriptions of Assyrian and Babylonian kings talking about them having killed hundreds of lions in the hunt. And there's a historical basis to this too, which was around 1000 BC, Mesopotamia was infested with lions and it was causing a real problem, so someone had to go and kill them. But um, in general, the lion hunt and hunting as a whole, the, the entire activity, it had a certain ideological significance. And what that was, was the king's ability to battle these creatures of chaos, really. The lion symbolized the wild forces of nature. And in engaging in lion hunting, the king was showing himself to be the champion of order and justice. And that's why in the Persian period, it was actually tantamount to treason to usurp the king in a lion hunt. And there's a story of Artaxerxes I. He's actually out there hunting lions with his nobles. And one of the nobles who actually helped him become king he sees a lion charging the king, and Artaxerxes doesn't see the lion coming, and so the noble goes and kills the lion with his spear. What's the reward he gets for this? He gets exiled to an island in the Persian Gulf where he eventually contracts leprosy. And the reason was that when he did that, he showed himself to be, for that moment, a greater champion, really a greater sportsman, a greater athlete than the king. And that was, again, you know, that was tantamount to treason. So lion hunting, it was a sport. Hunting as a whole, it prepared the people for war. It was taken very seriously as an activity. Uh, but it also had this ideological significance as well. Great. Uh, Trita, you have the fortune of, to be known as one of the leading experts on American-Iranian international relationships, politics. So you get to answer with the most controversial questions. But um, my next one for you is less controversial. So, you know, some have compared Magna Carta and the Constitution of the United States to the Cyrus Cylinder. Are these fair comparisons? Why or why not? Uh, 
I think there's several people in this audience, frankly, who would be much, much better at answering this question. Oh, uh, maybe this, this one. Oh, yes, sign of God. Yes. And I, would <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think uh, there's several people in this audience that probably are better off uh, with much more knowledge than I have on that specific issue. But it appears to me, as someone who's not an expert in that field, that mindful of the fact that the sign is sitting there at the end of the day, seems to be putting these two documents in different categories. Now, it would have been a very interesting evolution of history if actually the Cyrus Cylinder would have been a source of inspiration for the future political systems in the Middle East from that time on. If that was the case, then clearly we would have seen a very, very different situation in the Middle East, not only today, but throughout the last couple of hundred years. It seems like, if anything, unfortunately, Cyrus has been in the dustbins of history for far too long. Great. What I would say is that each of these documents that you just named, when they were composed, at that moment they served a practical purpose that was different from the more expansive purposes they served in the future and the reputations they have today. And Magna Carta is a very good example of this, as a matter of fact. When it was first drafted, the purpose was really to uphold the rights of a very small subsection of the English population. It was the landed aristocracy. It was to uphold their rights against the king. But Magna Carta got the ball rolling, and it's because of Magna Carta that we have constitutional law in England. And the US Constitution is the same thing. They teach us in law school that it was meant as a living, breathing text, meaning it was not perfect. They didn't serve all purposes at that time. But let's think about how many times it's been amended to reflect the societal values that we hold dear today. And some people say that it should still be amended. It's, it will most definitely be amended in the future. What these documents are, and I think the Cyrus Cylinder falls in this category as well, is that they are snapshots. They're snapshots in time of these, height, of these moments of heightened consciousness in politics and statecraft. And the snapshot we get with the Cyrus Cylinder is the beginning of this movement away from the more brutish and oppressive forms of conquest and rule used by the Assyrians and the Babylonians. Great. Terrific. <laughs> I mean, it's always most encouraging to see scholars agree with each other. More often than not, they may not be. So again, let's uh, go back to history a little bit. And I'd like to uh, have Mitra and uh, uh, um, Riza both answer those questions. So we all have been truly impressed and admired the great accomplishments of Cyrus the Great. But granted to say nobody was or ever will be perfect. So what could be his, some of his significant failures? Or is his message of magnanimous conveyed through his decrees on plates or on cylinders really distributed extensively to the extent of his empire and be followed by his subjects? Well, based on our discussion today, I would say his downfall was not having a bigger ego and talk about himself more, leaves more documents. Um, and that itself actually says something about Cyrus's character. Uh, contrary, uh, we know that he was very unconventional for his time, but the fact that um, he never generated uh, public statements about himself and uh, his practices itself uh, says something about his character. Um, what I would like to personally um, advocate here when it comes to Cyrus Cylinder's exhibition is once again uh, his policies and uh, his ethics, uh, which um, despite the fact that they're old, we view them as old, uh, but they are um, very much um, in tune with our time, with our era, and what is happening uh, today. Well, any time a guy conquers and rules most of the known world, I think his successes far outweigh his failures. So let's begin there. I think Cyrus, 
he had three big successes. One was, first of all, he was a very good soldier. And he went and he conquered this entire area of land that was part of the Persian Empire. And it was something the world had never seen. The, before that, the Assyrian state was the largest empire. And the Persian Empire was four times the size of the Assyrian state at its greatest extent. And moreover, Cyrus formed it in the course of more or less 11 years, which is a very brief period of time. Second, more important than that, Cyrus established an administrative framework and a political ideology that allowed that empire to exist for over two centuries in relative stability. This is very important. The Assyrians, in the last 120 years of their existence, they fought 108 wars of conquest and repression to maintain the borders of their empire. And what that tells me is that the people resented their rule. The Persian Empire, on the other hand, one eminent historian has said that it maintained its boundaries with an impressively modest exertion of force. In other words, they didn't have to fight that hard. And that goes back to this policy of tolerance. And just as we see, for example, in the cylinder inscription, Cyrus declares himself to be the legitimate king of Babylon. And we see in the Old Testament, he's the Lord's anointed, legitimate king of the Jews. We also see his successors. They call themselves, when they go into Egypt, they pay homage to the Egyptian gods. And they do this in different places. And this is really the hallmark of his statecraft, which was something new at that time. And then the third thing that Cyrus did, which I think is remarkable, and he doesn't get nearly enough credit for this, is that he protected the great centers of civilization from these marauding tribes from Central Asia. These were the Scythians and the Sakas and the Sumerians. And they were a very destructive force. And in the 100, 150 years before Cyrus, they had ridden roughshod over many of the nations of the Near East. They were plundering, destroying agricultural settlements and what have you. And Cyrus really sacrificed his life. He died fighting these tribes to protect them and to seal that northeastern border of his empire. In my mind, his, really only, his only failure was that there was one group he could never get to buy into the Persian imperial message, and those were the Greeks. And I think this goes back to several factors. One, the Persians and Greeks, their relations, they just never got off on the right foot. It was like a bad <laughs> dating experience. It just never it was not meant to be. But more importantly, the Greeks, they had never suffered under Assyrian Babylonian rule, as had, say, for example, the Israelites or other peoples, the Phoenicians. And they had never really been terrorized by these steppe nomads the same way that other peoples had. So they never really appreciated Cyrus's empire as the antithesis to these former regimes. And then I think the third thing is that the Greeks lacked a tradition of absolute monarchy. And the Persian Empire, its ideology was centered around the exaltation of the king. And to the Greeks, the royal ideology of the Persians, it just rang hollow. It was pretentious. And as we all know, of course, it was the Greeks who ultimately conquered Cyrus's empire after some 200 years when Alexander marched through. But even then, when you consider the fate of Alexander's empire, you can't help but be impressed with what Cyrus did. Because like I said, Cyrus's empire, it stood. It was stable for over two centuries. Alexander's empire fragmented almost entirely after his demise. And the fragments of that empire, they were just losing ground consistently until they were ultimately absorbed in the west by the Romans and in the east by the Parthians. And this again, the contrast with the Achaemenids, it goes and it bespeaks Cyrus's amazing knack for statecraft. Great. We only have a few minutes. Please. Uh, now, we only have a few minutes uh, left before we open the floor to all of you so you can get to ask your questions. So let's once again ask the last question I will ask about our time, our contemporary time that we all live in and the legacy of Cyrus the Great. So, and I'd like to all the three panelists to, uh, to answer, but start with Trita. So looking forward, how do each of you think Cyrus Cylinder will be used in the generations to come? And what purpose could Cyrus Cylinder serve? Which version of human history will it tell? Will it be used to justify good or evil? And also, as just a little bit of historical notes, we all know that Shah Muhammad Reza Pahlavi's sister famously gifted a replica of the Cyrus Cylinder to the United Nations. The giving still, to some extent, the disputed history of the object. Should the United Nations continue to display it, does it substantively speak to the United Nations values? So, Trita, why don't we start with you? Uh, I remember when I, about 
15 years ago or so ago, I worked at the Security Council for the Swedish government. And right outside the room there, you have uh, the Cyrus cylinder, the replica of it, of course, with an explanation of, of what it is. And, and it is extremely fitting uh, for it to be the mindful of the mandate uh, of the United Nations uh, to, uh, for state traffic for resolution of conflict. As to the specific question of what do we see in the future, it ultimately depends on what we decide to do with the story of science. Now I'm going to give a tremendous amount of uh, uh, credit to IHF, uh, uh, the Iran Heritage Foundation, to PIA, and all of those who have sponsored the tour of Cyrus Cylinder throughout the United States, because this is a piece of knowledge, this is a piece of history that is so valuable, so rich, something that binds together both Iranians and Americans, transcends political ideology, and yet it was so unknown, and still remains far too unknown compared to what it could be. But what this tour has done has been a huge step forward in the right direction. And again, what it will be in the future will be what we decide to make it. Whether we take inspiration from the manner in which Cyrus 2,500 years ago created that unprecedented period of peace, that respect uh, for uh, the rights of communities, at least if you don't want to go with the human rights uh, interpretation, and, and see what we do with it in order to be able to create those commonalities that are so essential in order to be able to create stability today. But we can't do a single thing of any of these things. We can't even misinterpret Cyrus if we first don't even know about Cyrus. So the step that you hear and started off in Washington a couple of months ago, I think is an absolutely essential first step towards making sure that Cyrus and his wisdom is interwoven into our future. Great. Mitra, your remarks? Yes, absolutely. Um, the artifact itself, I think, um, it should be uh, still uh, studied and preserved as an archaeological um, artifact to help us better understand who we are today. Because I truly believe it's understanding, in understanding the past, that we get to know ourselves today, how we got here, and who we are today. The position, the placing of the uh, replica in the United Nations building, it's, um, it's where it should be um, as a reminder. Um, um, and just to add to that, um, next to the replica on the wall um, in the United Nations, uh, there is a, 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 a poem uh, by a famous loved uh, Persian poet, Saidi, uh, which is a, the rough translation of it uh, reads as, um, the humanity, we're all different limbs of the same body. We were created from the same essence. And once a limb, a part of the body, is suffering, then the entire body is suffering. And um, I think um, there was perhaps somebody put uh, lots of thoughts into putting that verse right into next to the replica. So um, that's it. Great. Riza? Yes. Well, I sincerely think that the Cyrus Cylinder does deserve to be respected and it does deserve to be honored. Perhaps not as a charter of human rights, as, as some people have said, because I don't think the concept really accept, uh, existed back then. But what the cylinder represents to me is, like I said again, it's this snapshot. It's the most comprehensive textual record we have from the reign of a king, a great king, who won the admiration not only of his own people, but of the people he ruled. A, a king who, under, whose, under whose reign these innovative philosophical and religious ideas diffused around the world. Really, I'm talking about ideas such as the immortality of the soul, the battle between good and evil, truth and lie. And a king whose enlightened role of statecraft this respect for local customs and tolerance of religions and of different people really laid the groundwork for globalism as we know it. Great. So, another round of applause for our speakers. Now let's see who's the lucky one who gets to ask the first question. 
Yes, the madam in the front. Yes, uh, the mic is on the way. Yeah. Thank you. This may be a question, <coughs> a question for Mr. Curtis. Is, what's known about the translation and the, tr and the translator? And because we're all reading it as we read it today in English, and there, uh, we all know that in translation there are subtle differences. John, will you care to answer the question? I didn't quite hear the question, but it was about the, the, the modern translation. Uh, is it, yeah. Well, it's actually very recently been uh, a new translation that's been produced by my colleague, Dr. Irving Finkel, and I, I would say that's the most authoritative translation that ought to be used, and it's indeed it's the translation which is being shown uh, in the exhibition. In fact, the very first translation by Theophilus Pinches um, was a good translation, but it has to be said that since then, some um, spurious translations have appeared in hard copy um, and on the web, and those uh, aren't really to be trusted. But go with the new translation, which is in the exhibition catalogue and which has been done by uh, Dr. Finkel. And I think that everybody, I know there are some um, uh, colleagues, the seriologists here uh, in the audience, and I think they'll all agree that that is the best, best and most responsible uh, and reputable translation. Yes, the gentleman. Yes, um, I'd like to see or hear from the colleagues on the stage here what we know about Cyrus's wife and children, and in particular uh, how they uh, uh, were involved in his his own life. Sure. We know that Cyrus had one wife named Kassandan, and she was the daughter of a very important Persian noble who Cyrus probably married her in order to solidify some sort of tribal alliance at the outset of his reign. And we know from Herodotus that Cyrus was very devoted to this wife. And in fact, in the Babylonian Chronicle, the Chronicle of Nabonidus, reference is made to Cyrus imposing a period, uh, I believe is a three-day period of mourning throughout his empire for her when he died. And Herodotus lauds his love for this woman. Cyrus, according to another Greek historian named Catasius, and Xenophon also backs him up on this, had another wife who was, the, who was actually his aunt, if you believe the genealogies. She was the daughter of the Median king. And when he conquered Media, he took her as his bride. And he did that again to solidify a alliance between his own people, the Persians, and the Medes. And we know that he had at least two sons, Cambyses, who was his eventual successor and who is mentioned in the Cyrus Cylinder. And the mention of him in the Cyrus Cylinder shows that already by 539 BC that Cambyses was recognized as the heir apparent to the throne. And Cambyses was the son of Cyrus and Cassandan, his Persian bride. And there was another son named Bardia. And Bardia was, according to some of the sources, he was instated as the viceroy of the eastern provinces, whereas Cambyses was the viceroy of the west. And of course, after Cyrus died, the two of them had a falling out. And according to the sources, Cambyses killed Bardia because Bardia was making a move for the throne. But he kept that hush hush. And that's, that all leads to the drama that led to Darius's rise to power. But Cyrus also had three daughters. Uh, Atosa, whom I mentioned, who is his eldest. Uh, the jury is out uh, as to who, who the mother was there, but some people say that it was the Median princess, and that she, she was really the heiress to the Median estate, and that's why Cambyses married Atosa after Cyr when he became king. And then after Cambyses died, Darius married her too, perhaps to just solidify the union, his own attachment to Cyrus, and perhaps also to the Median royal house. And then he had two other daughters. One was named Roxanne, and then Cambyses also married her. Perhaps she was the full sister of Atosa. And then the other one was named Artistona. And Artistona is mentioned in the Persepolis Fortification Tablets, which is this archive that's been found and is currently really the centerpiece of Achaemenid studies, is its translation and interpretation. We know that she was a high-ranking woman. She was Darius's favorite bride. He married her too, and he's said to have made this marvelous statue of gold. Great. You can remember all of that. <laughs> Amazing. 
and we want to be magnanimous. So we have taken two questions from front. Now we go to the back. Any question from the back of the room? Raise your hands or stand up, please. There's a lady, I think, on that side. Yes, uh, the mic is on the way. Here, over there. First of, first of all, I'm a grandmother of Atusa. And I want to thank everyone who has arranged all this uh, magnificent uh, program. My question is, is, is that right that our belief and our religion just reflects in our action and our work? And at that time, I believe no one was mentioning their own religion. The first time that we can see, it is Darius that he says, Ahura Mazda, uh, who should save this country from the lying and from the drought. This was the first time that we hear that someone announces their religion. It's not like today that we are carrying some signs or we are putting some cover or something like that. But I believe, as Professor Mary Boyce mentions, that Achaemenians definitely they were carrying the message of Zarathustra for more than 1,300 years. This is the question from the panel. Was that really, we are sure that they were Zoroastrians or not, Cyrus was Zoroastrian, or not as a religion, as someone who has had an ethical belief, which we can call it cosmic ethics, which is based on harmony, beauty, happiness, balance between all the uh, federations that he created. The second thing that I want to announce is that the replicate of this cylinder will be uh, ribbon cut uh, at Dianzo College on the um, 21st of August at 11 o'clock um, at the library. Anyone who wants to see or participate the cutting the ribbon of the cylinder, the replicate, they can come, they are welcome to come to the Anza College on, again on 21st of August at 11 o'clock. Thank very you good. very much. Um, we have to, again, keep in mind that um, just because a king mentions um, a particular term or a name of a god doesn't mean they're necessarily the follower of that one uniquely, that one particular god. Just as Cyrus mentions many gods out of respect, reverence, um, and we should just leave it at that and not read more into it. Uh, you mentioned the term um, how the religion, how religion is born, and I agree with you. Um, religion is pretty much the cultural product of um, the community that practices it. Um, that's why I'm, I'm hoping that the outcome of um, this exhibition would be um, to educate the public more about who Iranians are, who Persians are. By the way, we never got to discuss the differences between Iranians and Persians, and vice versa. These terms are interchangeably used when they shouldn't be, unfortunately. Um, but in any case, um, going back to Ahura Mazda, um, we have to know the etymology of the word, um, which is a, um, a compound of Ahura and Mazda. She was referring to um, Ahura Mazda, for those of you who don't know, as um, the main deity, the god, with a capital G, in uh, um, Zoroastrian, uh, Zoroastrianism uh, tr uh, tradition, which, of course, again, I hesitate to use the word Zoroastrianism uh, when we're discussing Cyrus, because we don't know if he was a practitioner. But the word itself um, um, is um, rooted in Indo-European uh, linguistics, and we have traces of it um, going back to uh, first millennium BCE, of course, uh, with a different uh, pronunciation, because as you know, the consonants and vowels do change. 
uh, linguistically. So the name uh, Asura Mazaha was uh, attested uh, much earlier in uh, an, um, one of the uh, tablets uh, from um, Assyrian king um, Ashur Benipal. Um, but that leaves a long discussion about what Ahura means, um, uh, the concept itself, and also what type of uh, divinities are attached to the word Ahura, and also Mazda, what Mazda is and what it means. Good. Uh, why don't we go to the side of the room and get the opportunity to the last question. Yes, sir. Yeah, the um, mic, please. Wait for the mic, please. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. I seem to remember that Cyrus's uh, mother was Mead. That's one question. Secondly, um, his son Cambyses, when he conquered Egypt, he killed the Apis bull, who was called was divinity, for, who was a god for the Egyptians. And then he uh, didn't treat the priest of Siwa very well in the prophecies. So apparently the gods were mad at him and swallowed his army. So he didn't follow the tolerance of his father. Is that correct? Well, it, what, you're, what you're relating to me is the tradition about Cambyses that's found in Herodotus. And Herodotus, for a long time, scholars took him on his word when he said that he killed the Apis bull. However, we have an artifact that shows Cambyses actually prepared a sarcophagus for the Apis bull. And there's an artifact that shows him re uh, revering it, or there's an inscription. So we know that Herodotus, Herodotus is misinformed at best, or at worst, he just made it up. And the suspicion is that what, Ca what Cambyses did was he increased the taxes on the Egyptian temples probably to maintain his army, and there you go. I mean, right there, the priests, they started spinning rumors about what a bad guy he was and how he was evil. But... <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. So, so, so we can safely discard that story. As to Cyrus's mother being Median, yes, that's found both in Herodotus and in Xenophon and other, uh, other sources. Uh, and I think there's good truth to it. One, we know at that time that uh, these kings were in the habit of using political marriages to solidify their, their conquests and their lands. And we know at that time the Medes and the Persians were in some sort of an alliance. Some people say that the Medes ruled over the Persians. And it makes sense then that the king of Media would marry his daughter to the prince of the Persians to maintain that alliance. And it furthermore, I think, explains one other thing, which is in the Babylonian Chronicle. This is a more neutral uh, description of Cyrus's reign. It's uh, discussed in the third person. It talks about Cyrus's campaign against the Medes. And mention there is made of the Median army abandoning its king and handing the king over to Cyrus while they're campaigning in the heart of Persian territory. And that to me, tell, that's not normal. The Medes, were, the Medes were in the enemy's terrain. They were winning the war when that happened. And so I think that one of the explanations for that is that yes, Cyrus was part Median and there very well could have been a movement among certain Median nobles to raise Cyrus as a properly legitimate candidate to the throne instead of his grandfather. Great, and I think indeed, oh, there's one person eagerly raised hands, so I could not let pass. Yes, thank you. I wanted to know if there was a significance be behind the cylinder itself as a shape, for a geographical shape versus like the other slabs of history that we see like Rosetta Stone or the Ten Commandments that is just on a slab of rock versus the cylinder itself. John, you want to give it a try? <laughs> I'll try and answer that. I don't think there is actually um, a very good answer, but it is a traditional form um, in Mesopotamia to write foundation inscriptions of barrel cylinders um, of this shape. I think part of the reason is that uh, you can revolve the um, cylinder and, and so the inscription in a sense is never ending. When you come to the last line, you immediately come on to the first line again. So it's rather clever uh, in that respect. They not all 
always barrel shaped. They're sometimes more cylindrical, but um, usually they are. But the Persians, of course, also wrote, did write proclamations, um, uh, well, on uh, rock inscriptions, uh, Darius of Busatun, and, and indeed um, on, on their palaces. I mean, uh, inscriptions in Old Persian on, on, on the relief. So they used different types of media. On that note, let's give a big round of applause to John and all our three scholars. Thank you so much for spending your time and expertise with us. So, Deb. Thank you.